2019. And welcome. I'm Linda Jacobs, Director of Development at the American Philosophical Society. I'm pleased to welcome so many of our friends of the APS to this talk by Renee Walcott. The Friends of the APS provide critical unrestricted support that allows the society to allocate the funds where they're most needed. Last year, generous gifts from the Friends allowed us to convert all of our programs to a virtual platform, support scholars and researchers working remotely, and install new air filtration systems in all of our buildings, ensuring our continued safety when we once again gather in person. Thank you. First, a few housekeeping issues. Uh, this talk is being presented in webinar format, so all of you are muted. To take advantage of closed captioning, please click on the CC button on the taskbar. At the conclusion of Renee's talk, we'll have some time for questions. I invite you to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A button. Today, we're in for quite a treat. Our speaker, Renee Walcott, is Assistant Head of Conservation and Book Conservator at the Society. She's traveled an interesting path to the APS. For many years, Renee worked as a journalist, editor, and public relations specialist, and she's brought the rigor and intellectual curiosity of those professions to her work in conservation. Renee received an MS in art conservation from the Winterthur University of Delaware program in 2011. Prior to joining the APS staff, she worked as a book conservator at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts here in Philadelphia, and she served as an adjunct professor in the Department of Art, Art Conservation at the University of Delaware. In addition to her book conservation work, she's curated an exhibition entitled Conservation and the Peel Sellers Family Collection and edited a volume of the APS's transactions on the same subject. Today, Renee will be speaking on some of the special techniques she's used on materials that have been adopted through the Society's Adopt-A-Book program. One volume is Petros Bramus's Via Regia Ad Geometrium, an English geometry textbook whose leaves were crumpled and half eaten by mold. Renee will also be speaking about the conservation treatment of George Catlin's 1867 Oki Pa, which describes a religious ceremony of the Mandan tribe. This is but one volume from the library's 1900 linear feet of unique manuscripts, photographs, and audio recordings related to over 650 different indigenous cultures of the Americas. This seems an appropriate moment to acknowledge that the society's home rests on the traditional lands of the Lenape people. We honor their community and those of other native peoples through our collections, fellowships, research awards, and outreach activities. Once again, thank you for your support and, join, and enjoy the talk. Renee? Thank you, Linda, for that wonderful introduction. It's very generous. Um, and I'm so thankful that everybody has joined me today for this talk. I look forward to sharing some of my experiences of the last year with you um, with some unusual treatments that the Adopt-A-Book program brought to me. So I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen and a presentation with you. So I'm going to focus on two of the three books that I worked on over the last year. It's not typical that I only focus on three books during a year, um, and I did more things than that during the pandemic, but because our time on site was somewhat limited, um, my work was also somewhat limited. Another thing you'll notice during this talk is I have very few pictures of myself because I was usually working alone. So uh, you will see mostly pictures of the, of the books that I was treating and occasionally my hands, um, but I was having to do um, all the photography myself. Uh, so those are two things that are a little different about this presentation. As Linda said, I'm going to be talking about the two books that you see here. Okipa is on the left and has a Kachuk binding, which I will describe for you more fully when we get to it. And the binding on the right is uh, Petrus Ramos's um, Avia Adi, blah, Via Regia Ad Geometrium. I can never get that right. Uh, and it has a scaleboard binding, and I will also describe that when we get to it. Um, both of these books were adopted by James and Pamela Hill, 
And um, if you're interested in the adopt a book program, I encourage you to check it out. There are always um, books up for conservation treatment there, and it is a real pleasure to work on these books. So the first book I'm going to talk about is this um, 1867 case binding um, by George Catlin, and it is a white man's view of the um, tribe related to the, oh, sorry, the Mandan tribe, um, their religious ritual that, in which the warriors of the tribe described their fortitude, endurance, and courage um, for the rest of the people in the tribe. And uh, it arrived to conservation um, looking okay on the outside, but when you opened it, you could see that all the leaves had fallen out. Um, and been repaired by a former owner to keep them together. And the reason the leaves had fallen out is because um, it, it was a kachuk binding. And the kachuk binding is um, probably the first sort of perfect binding. So what you would get if you um, took a, a manuscript you printed yourself and took it to Staples or someplace like that to be bound, it's put together only with adhesive. There's no sewing and the only single leaves are put into the binding. Uh, rather than folios or folded sheets that are sewn together through the fold, which was the traditional way of binding during the hand binding and hand printing period. And you can see this sort of reddish brown residue on the spine lining um, behind the text block. That is the kachuk itself. And kachuk was um, essentially a rubber latex from tropical plants that was sticky and flexible. Um, so you could take your single sheets and apply layers of kachuk to the spine. And then after several layers of kachuk, attach a fabric lining. And for many years, the book would open beautifully. So the, the books were popular because they opened flat. Um, the kachuk binding was patented by William Hancock in 1836 um, as the sort of first perfect binding method that we're aware of. By the 1860s, when Okipa was published, it was really popular for coffee table books, art books, things with beautiful plates that you wanted to open flat and lie attractively on your table that you could page through and they would be very flexible and the leaves would be firmly attached. So it did seem at first to be a perfect binding indeed, but within 50 to 100 years, um, if you've ever had a pencil with a rubber eraser, you know that after a certain period of time, that rubber eraser no longer functions as an eraser anymore. <laughs> it becomes brittle and rigid and stiff. And if you try to erase something with it, it just sort of scratches up the paper. Kachuk, which is also essentially a rubber, does the same thing. It becomes hard and brittle and dried out and it isn't at all flexible anymore. And so when you turn the pages, they just fall out. Um, and what you're left with is this sort of glassy, orange brown residue on the spine lining that once held the book together. So a former owner before it came to the APS, trying to save the text block from falling apart any further, put it back together by wrapping these four pieces of linen tape around the interior of the text block. So from the half title page around to the last blank leaf of the book. And he or she also slathered the spine folds of the book, well, the spine, um, with a mysterious adhesive that was kind of this milky white adhesive. And that also kept the leaves together. Unfortunately, one of the plates, this is a book that has text leaves and then um, colored plates, which I'll show you in the next slide. And then a bunch of blank leaves just to bulk the leaf, sorry, to bulk the book up and make it look more impressive. Um, I lost my train of thought. Um, I was talking about adhesive. Anyway, to keep them all together. Oh yes, I remember. Um, so the, the one of the plates was lost uh, before this homemade repair was made. So there's supposed to be 13 plates and one of them is missing and was probably missing before this repair because everything around what is now the last plate is really was really firmly adhered with the homemade adhesive application. So this was my um, challenge with this book, an unusual binding to start with, and then an unusual repair to keep it together. So here you can see some of the plates from the back of the book or the middle of the book. This is how they were arranged when the book came to me. Um, but during my examination of the book, 
I discovered that some of the plates, uh, including this one, had been put in um, either upside down or backwards so that their foredge was toward the spine. So when I looked at the spine here, as you can see it, there were gold bits shimmering along the spine and the edges of the text block were gilt. So they were gold. Um, but when the person repaired the book, some of the plates are, you know, especially if they were in landscape orientation like this, you couldn't tell necessarily which way they went in without looking very closely to see where the gold edges were. So some of the exterior edges actually went in along the spine during this repair. Um, so one of my jobs once I got the book apart was to put it back in the proper order. Um, and like I said, there were 12 of these beautiful plates that were left. These are color lithographs. Um, and they were generally in quite good condition, except for being in there backwards. So my first task was to figure out how can I get these homemade repairs off of the book um, safely without, you know, doing it, without doing any additional damage to the paper if I can. Uh, and to do that in conservation, we do a lot of testing. So for the tapes and for the adhesive, I tested with both water and with heat to see what would um, make the adhesive loosen up and be able to be lifted. So linen tape is often water soluble. The adhesive generally uh, releases with water. And here you can see my test with water applied by brush. We use deionized water because it's pure and won't contain things like chlorine from tap water, which is harmful to paper. Um, and my test was successful. I could tell that moisture would allow the tape to be lifted. So here on the right, you can see that um, there were the book was not entirely stuck together with the mysterious adhesive, um, which I was worried might be Elmer's glue or something similar, which is very difficult to get off. Um, these first leaves were not attached to the rest. So I was able to release the tapes there. And this is the, the edge of the, um, the text block drying after I lifted those tapes. And this is the back of the book. And I am using a wheat starch paste poultice on each of the tapes to slowly and, set and gradually release moisture into the tape and then allow it to be lifted with a micro spatula when everything is nice and loose. So that is the process of removing the tape. And you can see I have a sheet of mylar within the text block to prevent the moisture from penetrating farther in, which is very important. Then I also needed to figure out what was going on with this milky adhesive on the spine. I did test it with heat as well, because a lot of um, adhesives will come off with heat rather than moisture. Um, that didn't really work. Uh, but I did notice when I heated the adhesive that it smelled strange, sort of medicinal and minty. Um, and when I tested, I, I broke off a little chunk of the adhesive and looked at it under the microscope and tested it with water. And I saw that it did dissolve and sort of turn the water this milky white color. Um, and that smelled minty too. And so when I talked to a fellow conservator, a paper conservator about this issue and described what the adhesive looked like in detail, she said, that sounds like mucilage. Uh, apparently they used to add this um, smell <laughs> to mucilage. Some of you may remember that from, from earlier in your life. It was new to me. Um, and so I knew that I did have a water soluble adhesive, which was really good news. And I thought potentially the easiest way to take the rest of the text block apart would be to wash it. Because um, you can see here along the spine that the edges of the leaves were not very well aligned when the adhesive was applied. So in places it seeped very deeply between the leaves. Um, and I was worried that I would do a lot of damage if I had to separate the leaves individually and mechanically that pieces would break off. Um, the, the most gentle thing to do for something like this is often to be able to immerse the whole text block in water. Um, so I needed to find out how the different materials of the text block would respond to water and whether this would be a good idea or not. So to do that, I again turned to the microscope and took um, droplets of deionized water and applied them by brush to the different papers in the text block. And like I said, there were three different types of paper in the text block. There was the text paper, which was fairly, um, you know, like a medium weight paper um, with a, a hard surface on it. And that's what you see here in the picture on the right. And you can see that the water droplet that I've applied over this hyphen 
is so rounded up, uh, standing very proud of the surface of the paper and casting this big shadow, uh, it did not absorb fully until after three minutes had passed, which is a very long time. This paper was not absorbent at all, which was a problem potentially. When you wash paper, you really want the paper the water to be absorbed evenly and all at the same time. Uh, if it takes a long time to penetrate and maybe penetrates more quickly in parts of the paper that are oxidized and broken down and doesn't penetrate at all in other areas, you risk two things. One is that um, you set up kind of tension between the areas of the paper that are already wet and the parts of the paper that are still dry and you can actually cause tears in the paper if the paper if the water is not absorbed evenly across the whole sheet. The other problem is that if the water is absorbed unevenly, you can get a mottled or tide lined appearance as the the um, discoloration in the paper moves around and is deposited unevenly in the sheet as it washes. So I did not want to just dunk these text leaves in water. I would need to apply ethanol to them to break the surface tension of the water and allow it to penetrate right away. And I was able to tell under the microscope that if I put down a droplet of ethanol or alcohol before I put down the water, it would be absorbed instantly. The other leaves were different. So the, the plates absorbed water pretty much instantly. They were very um, loosely sort of packed and the water could penetrate right away. And I could tell that there was discolor discoloration in the paper that would move um, when it was washed. And so they would be cleaned by, wash, by washing them. And all the blank leaves at the back, which were very thin, uh, were kind of like the text leaves. They didn't absorb water right away, um, but quicker, more quickly than the text leaves did. So I had three sort of different scenarios. And it looked like using ethanol would be necessary if I wanted everything to wash evenly. So then I needed to test everything with ethanol as well as water and to not only test the paper, which I had done, but to test all the inks in the document as well or in the book to make sure that they weren't soluble in either of those solutions. So I tested again the text pages, the letterpress printing ink as expected was not soluble in either water or ethanol because it's an oil based ink. So that was great. That was looking good. I tested then the plates. So as I said, those are color lithographs. Lithography is also an oil-based ink process. So those were also insoluble in water and ethanol. So we were looking good to go. However, there was a library inscription early on in the book. The APS put it there. And um, you can see this is from its 1969 accession into the library. And they wrote in ballpoint at the top of the page to sort of give this book an a specific number. Well, this ballpoint was insoluble in water, but when I touched a brush with a tiny amount of ethanol to it, you can see that it immediately bled out into the paper. Ballpoint ink has gone through a number of formulations over the years, but it is generally uh, alcohol-based. They were originally oil-based, but in the 20th century, they became alcohol-based, sort of heavy alcohol bases. Um, and so ethanol was not going to be good for this because if I dipped this page in ethanol, all the blue would come either it would both bleed out into the rest of the paper and it would go into the water and deposit onto all the other paper in the book. So that was unacceptable. And I knew that to treat the book safely, I would need to eliminate this inscription to the extent possible. And I'm happy to say that the APS no longer uses ballpoint in its books. We now use pencil, which is the only sensible thing to write in a book with. All right, so here are my experiments with removing that inscription. I, of course, documented it. Part of conservation is that we document everything very thoroughly before we ever start treatment so that we know what things looked like before we intervened. And then we document everything that we do to a book. And then we document everything really thoroughly again after treatment so that we know uh, how we've changed the book. And if anybody needs to mess with it again in the future, they know exactly what we've done. So um, we know what the inscription says, even if it is no longer legible after my treatment. On the left here, you can see the result I got from just repeatedly adding a droplet of ethanol and then blotting it up with a cotton blotter. This is often a good way to remove staining in paper, but I was not thrilled with the results here. You can see that um, 
the ink has bled laterally into the paper to a pretty large extent. At first, it looked like it was going to work terrific. The, there were sort of blue and purple components of the ink, and they came out right away. Um, but you can see how sensitive the ink is. I was only putting ethanol right over this part of the inscription, but the one in the 1721 part of the inscription is already starting to bleed there. But then uh, once the blue and purple were out, this green, which had also spread out in the paper, just wouldn't budge any further. It was there to stay and ethanol was not moving it any further. So I thought, oh, this is not, this is not terrific. I need to find a better solution to this problem. So I took the book over to um, the suction platen, and the suction platen is a device that pulls air through a perforated metal sheet, um, and you can control the window through which it sort of sucks the air and make a very narrow opening right over the inscription or stain that you want to treat. So I made a little window just the size of half of the inscription, and then I tested different solvents on the surface of the inscription. And anything that is dissolved in the ink and any leftover solvent gets sucked through the paper and down into a sheet of cotton blotter underneath. And that's what you see here, this white material. So I tested, you know, obviously I treated it some more with ethanol to see that what would happen. And these results on the middle pit photograph are of ethanol moving the purple and blue components out, as I described before, into the strip of cotton blotter and you just keep moving the blotter so that you're not always exposing the back of the sheet to the stuff that's been dissolved out. And you can see very clearly that the purple stuff came out first and then the blue started coming out. Um, but again, the green is sort of left behind here in the middle, but you can see the suction prevents the, the ink from bleeding laterally in the paper as the first half of the inscription had done. So I really wanted to get rid of more of this ink if I could. So I started testing other solvents and pretty much nothing did anything. Um, I did test ethyl acetate, which is a solvent that uh, is often useful in removing things like scotch tape. And that actually pulled some yellow out of the paper, which I thought was very interesting and unusual because I didn't see any obvious yellow component to the ink. And then at last I tried a formulation that was used at the conservation center where I worked before coming to the APS. Um, and that if they called it magic juice because it was often really good at removing staining of different kinds. Um, it's a combination of deionized water, benzyl alcohol, acetone and um, ethanol. And that actually did a great job at moving more of the green material. So here you can see there's the green halo from my inscription and also a little hint more of the yellow coming out. So that was doing great. And I was very excited about my results until after treating it until nothing more would move out of the inscriptions, I realized I had produced not only um, a reduction in the ink, but that the yellow of the paper was also disappearing around the inked areas. So the paper was no longer yellow or cream colored as you see here, it was actually turning white. Um, I had assumed that this paper was yellow because it was older and discolored. It's common that older paper turns yellow as it ages, that's a natural process. This is not a naturally yellow paper. There's actually a dye or potentially a surface coating that makes the paper yellow. So that was, kind of a terrifying moment. <laughs> and so I had to figure out what do I what do, what do I do now? Is it actually safe to wash this paper? So I went and looked at the paper under ultraviolet illumination and found that indeed there is some component to this paper that fluoresces kind of an orangey yellow. So you can see this yellow orange. This is partly just oxidation of the paper sheet at the edge but it also glows under ultraviolet light. And where I had um, applied the different solvents and water and ethanol, there is a dark blue area. That's not from the ink. That is actually a place where this fluorescence doesn't happen anymore. The paper is absorbing UV illumination instead of reflecting it black back to you. So I had a, removed this original component of the paper. That gave me pause uh, because I thought, well, if I can't, I also looked at the other um, areas where I had just tested with water or just tested with ethanol when I was looking at the different inks. And I could tell that even those disturbed this fluorescence, the paper turned 
you know, just became absorbent to UV after, um, after even in those little testing spots. And I thought, gee, if I wash this paper as planned, even though the ink is now safe, nothing else is going to come out. If I dip this paper in ethanol, I'm going to lose this fluorescence throughout the text part of the book. Um, I'm removing some original component. Um, and I wasn't comfortable with that. So I decided at least for the text leaves, I would not wash them after all. I would separate them mechanically and with locally applied moisture, which I had hoped to avoid, but it went okay. Um, and here, this sheet under ultraviolet illumination shows um, two things. So I would take a water brush, separate the leaves that were stuck together with the mucilage. I would apply the water in the sort of seam between the leaves and the gutter between the leaves to soften the, um, the adhesive. And then I would gradually work with a Microsoft, right? Bleh, sorry, with a micro spatula to separate the leaves. And I would wipe my brush and my micro spatula on this piece of water. And what you see here, this blue white um, fluorescence is from the mucilage, which also um, was very fluorescent. And then all these little curly orangey yellow bits are the pieces of paper that were stuck in the mucilage and um, broke off during this treatment. So that was how I separated the text leaves and I did no more um, water or solvent based treatments with the text leaves. I did decide to go to proceed with washing the plates um, because they were so absorbent of water and they so much discoloration moved when I got them wet during testing that I knew they would benefit a lot from washing. Um, discoloration I knew would come out, acidic products would come out and it would also allow me to remove the mucilage much more gently than in that local approach that I ended up taking with the text leaves. So aside from the first plate, which I had to remove mechanically from the text in front of it, um, I was able to separate the remaining plates by putting them in water and then allowing the mucilage to gently dissolve. And about after about 10 minutes in the water, I could easily separate the plates just using a brush to separate the leaves. And then they could be um, continued the treatment as separate pieces of paper. And the, the yellow that you see here, some of it is discoloration from the paper. So it's actually aged paper um, bits and acidic products coming out into the water, but a lot of it is from the mucilage. So it was milky white on top, but it was sort of this crystalline yellow underneath, and it turned the water this sort of lemony color, which is um, not quite the usual shade you see when you're washing paper, although often something yellow comes out when you wash. And you can see the difference, the drastic difference between the sort of first bath, these sheets were all stuck together, and these plates were all stuck together. Um, this is the first bath and this is the second bath. So much less yellow material is coming out the longer it's washed. And this um, picture on the right also shows you the same thing, sort of first, second and third bath for these plates. So I did wash the plates. Um, I also decided to wash the blank leaves at the back of the book, even though they were similar in color to the text leaves and had a similar fluorescence. They were so crumpled in places and um, very thin and weak compared to the text pages that I thought the benefit of washing them and the ease with which I would be able to remove the adhesive outweighed the risks associated with removing that original size, especially or, or dye, especially because they were blank. <laughs> you know, nobody's going to be consulting this book's blank leaves for any purpose. Um, so I washed them as well. I did dip them in ethanol first so that the water would penetrate evenly. And then I proceeded with washing those. So two of the three parts of the book were bathed and the first part was not. And I dried everything um, between felts. And once it was dry, I could proceed with mending and um, guarding the book back together. And guarding is the, the term we use for providing hinges of new um, paper material in between single sheets to create a folded um, folio of paper that can be sewn through. So this is my setup uh, downstairs in the Fells room of Franklin Hall at, at the APS. We did not share the lab during the pandemic. The lab is where I'm sitting right now, um, but we wanted to have only one person in the space at a time. So when somebody else was working upstairs, I worked downstairs here brought a bench down and here I am mending and guarding the
books leaves into folios using um, Asian paper, which is commonly used in art conservation because it is thin, flexible, very strong, and it has really good aging properties. Um, it's somewhat translucent as well, so it can kind of disappear into the original paper. And once all that was done, I could sew the book through the spine folds over, um, oh, obviously, <laughs> I'm back, back up for a second. Um, because this book had only been in single sheets before, I had to invent a new sewing structure for it. It had not had one before. Um, and the spine folds I was creating were all new to this book. But the leaves were pretty much evenly divisible by six. So I divided the leaves into sec nested sections of six leaves each and then sewed through the fold of those. And this is my sewing setup here on the right with um, rainy ribbon sewing supports, which are flexible and very thin, and I knew would sort of disappear into the original case binding when I use the ends of these slips to reattach the, the binding of the book to the text block. And I used link stitching, which allows, you know, gives us some additional support to the spine when the book is opened later. After the book was all sewn, uh, and I had reattached the end leaves, the green end leaves, um, I provided spine linings and here's the book in a press. Um, and I've applied some more Asian paper over the spine and given it a very slight round, which would have been how it was shaped originally. And when you're lining the spine of a book, you want to give it enough support. So when you open the book, it creates a nice gentle arc. As it opens, the spine forms a nice um, gentle arc rather than breaking at a V shape. Um, and that helps prevent it from splitting as it ages. So I lined it both with Asian paper and then some Western paper later on, which um, is less flexible and gives it some more rigidity. And these extensions are what help along with those, um, the ends of the rainy ribbon sewing supports to reattach the book into its case binding. So a case binding is where the binding of the book is not built on the text block after the text block is put back together. Um, the case is actually built completely separately and then attached to the book after it's bound. So this, this is the case. And these extensions can be inserted under the paste downs, which I lifted. So the new material can go under here and everything becomes sort of seamless and invisible if I do my job right. And I think it went pretty well. You can never get a gilt edge like these to line up perfectly after treatment, um, the way they were sort of a beautiful, shiny, flat gold surface before treatment. Um, but I was delighted to see that the book actually fit back into its case binding. That's always a little bit of a dilemma when you're working on um, a book that had no spine folds to begin with and you're putting in new material at the spine, it creates extra thickness that often can prevent a book from fitting back into the original spine thickness. But this one fit just fine. Um, that was a big relief. And I also was able to reinforce the spine from the inside when the book was out with more Asian paper that was toned to match the discolored spine material there. Uh, this is the before and after treatment of this opening of the book. So here where the tapes were, you can see they've been removed. This lovely inscription that says how rare the book is um, and the green paste down is exposed here. So it opened very nicely. I did, I should say, I did save the Kachuk spine lining, which I removed during treatment. So that is there um, as a reference if anybody is ever curious about the materials of this book after the fact. And I'll show you that in a minute. So here before treatment, this is how the, the plates were arranged in the book. And as I said, some of them were backwards or upside down. That also turned out to be true of the blank leaves. Um, there was nothing to guide the, the former owner in reassembling the book to say which way the leaves should go in. And those also many of those were put in with the outer edge toward the spine. Some of them were also flipped upside down. And the only reason I could tell is that like with many books, this book is not square. So the leaves were only properly aligned in one orientation. So that was something of a, um, a detective uh, work while I was putting the book back together was figuring out which orientation the leaves should be in. Um, so based on everything I could observe, the plates are now in their original orientation with regards to one another and to the rest of the text block. So now I'm gonna give you a very special treat and actually show you this book in person. So here is the um, 
book. I trust that for you, it is not upside down and backwards as it is for me. Um, this is the Kachuk, whoops, the Kachuk spine lining. So you can see it's sort of shiny and glassy, that old adhesive. Um, that is the sort of rubbery material that originally held the book together as, a, as an adhesive, um, holding the, the leaves in place. And it is now totally brittle and useless as a, as a material to hold the book together. We often retain as much original material as possible so that later researchers can see how a book was, was made. This is the non-woven polyester material that we support leaves on when we're washing them. So we don't just dunk pages into water without anything to support them. This does not swell in water, it stays very strong. And so when the paper becomes weak because it's wet, this serves to support it and we can always lift and move the paper around on, on this sheet. It's like the interfacing in clothing if you've ever made your own clothes. Um, so this is a very smooth non-woven polyester on which I supported the leaves of Okipa during bathing. This is the actual binding after treatment. You can see um, the new spine with the reinforced material. And I'll just flip through it a little bit for you. So this is the, um, the new adopted book plate. We always put these in when a book is adopted. This is new material here at the edge of the um, gutter. This is acrylic toned Asian paper that joins the newly um, sewn text block with the case. And then there's new material inserted underneath this paste down um, that holds the book together. Here's the half title page where the tape used to be. And um, let me see if it's working. There's a light here that I am attempting to turn on. No, it doesn't do very much. Anyway, um, here's this inscription that says, um, you know, this is now a very rare and valuable book. Yeah, it is. This is quite a, um, a rare survivor of this book, probably because they fell apart. So I'm delighted to have been able to save as much of this book as possible, even if one of the plates is missing. Um, half title page, I had to do quite a bit of mending at the edge there. It was all chipped. Same with the title page. You can see the publication information. And then here's the text. So you can tell it has not been, even though I cleaned it um, with uh, vulcanized rubber sponges to remove surface dirt, a lot of that is still obvious. It has um, handling marks. Um, and there's also some, some foxing of the leaves, but it's legible. The paper is strong and flexible still. So washing it was not a requirement. And I'm glad that I didn't remove this yellow coloration. Um, you can see the difference between this sort of more yellow sheet and then not this. These are the, the blank leaves at the back, which were washed. So this is whiter than these text leaves. I don't know that it shows up very well for you on the screen, but it, it, is, it is somewhat striking in person. Um, so after the text, you get some people uh, certifying that what George Catlin has said is true about the Mandan people. Um, and here's the difference between the, here, this is a drastic difference between the text paper and the plates, which are quite white. Um, so here are a few of the lithographic plates for your admiration. This had been in backwards before, facing the previous plate. These two do appear to have faced each other, although that is a, an unusual thing. You can see my new sewing here. Some more of the costuming associated with this ceremony. And here's the last plate facing the blank leaves of the book. And again, the blank leaves were just to sort of bulk the book up, make it thicker and make it look more um, important. This is a hinge related to um, 
attaching all of the leaves. This is one of the leaves that was in upside down. So I numbered all the leaves before taking the book apart. And you can see that this one is now upside down <laughs> because the whole leaf was in upside down as I found when I went to put it back together. So that is Okipa after um, it was complete and it is now a functional and usable book again. So now I'm gonna talk about the second of those two books that I worked on. So this is Petrus Ramos's um, Via Regia a Geometrion, which was published in London in 1636. Petrus Ramos was a, a French humanist scholar who first published this mathematical text in uh, the 1560s. And it was expanded and translated by William Bedwell for this London publication in 1636. Um, the book came to me um, with some specific problems. Um, the exciting thing for me about it was that it's a scale board binding. So it has these very thin wooden boards. And um, I'll tell you some more about that in a minute. Uh, and it also had this water damage. So everywhere you see here that's dark, the book had become wet and the crumpled leaves are associated with the water damage and the mold that colonized the book after uh, the water damage. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about scale board. So scale board is very thin wooden boards. Um, they are like a veneer. They are sort of a descendant of the um, Gothic wooden boards that were used back in the medieval period. These would have been very thick shaped wooden boards that went on large heavy books when literacy was very low and books were very rare. By the 17th century, when scale board first began to be produced, um, paper boards were much more popular for books. Um, paper had come to um, the Western world from China and the boards of most books were made from layers of paper. Scale board was actually cheaper, particularly in Northern Europe and in countries where paper could not be produced as readily. And so it was, it was um, frequently found in Northern Europe, in England. And then it also came to the colonies where paper was all imported from England and highly taxed. So wood was a local resource that was cheap and could be used easily. This is an American scale board binding on the right here. And you can see that although you might not expect it, scale board is actually lighter in weight than a paper board. And it's also very brittle and breaks easily. And these kinds of bindings were usually found on things like textbooks, um, books of sermons, political tracts, things like that. Um, that were used heavily, especially for textbooks, and would break over time, whereas a paper board might be able to stand up to the, the use, paper being much less brittle than wood. Um, as an English scale board binding, the wood grain in this book runs vertically rather than horizontally, and it's actually not the cheapest kind of scale board binding that's available. So it was actually sewn through the fold over three thongs that were then laced through the backboard. So put through little holes that were punched at the edge of the backboard. They went in over the outside of the board and then were threaded through to the inside and glued down. And you can see those remnants of those thongs in three places here on the backboard. The cheapest scale board bindings, as they often produce them here in the United States, were stabbed rather than sewn. So instead of taking the time to go through and sew the whole text block, as you saw me do with Okipa, they would actually just punch holes in the edge of the text block and then thread the thongs through those holes. But this meant that the book could never open all the way to the back because it's sort of, um, it's got these things stabbed through it, not all the way back at the gutter. And every time you open the book, um, it would stress these thongs and they would often break as you've seen here. So this is a, an American scale board binding from the library company. And often also these holes would kind of make the leaves perforated. So those would often rip out as well. So that's the cheapest of the cheap. Here you can see those thongs again, they were often stabbed through the book and then just pasted down. So they weren't laced through the boards either. You can see the evidence. This is another piece of evidence that this is a really cheap binding. It's got printer's waste for a partial paste down and then the wood is exposed. And you can see the wood grain here is going horizontally rather than vertically. 
Here, there's no pace down at all. So really cheap. And the leather here is not good quality either. These are flaying marks from the skin. And it's also sheepskin, which is the cheapest kind of leather you can use in a binding. Um, but I have a real soft spot for scaleboard, particularly American scaleboard. I did a whole research project on them when I was a graduate student. And these are some examples of American scaleboard bindings. They're not much to look at. They're very unassuming, but these are the kinds of books that ordinary average people would have been reading. They're not highly decorated. Their texts are uh, not expensive and they were often used to death. So they're very rare now, um, even though they're not they're not much to look at and have been largely ignored by, by scholars of bindings for that reason. Um, but I, I love them. So I was always very excited about this book as a potential treatment um, project. It was in the lab when I got this job and I opened it and just thought, oh, this needs so much tender love and care and I really would love to lavish that on this book. Um, as a result of having gotten wet, the, as I said, there was this mold issue with the leaves. Mold actually secretes enzymes into the paper. It's kind of like an inside out stomach. It sends out these little tendrils. It excretes, um, secretes a, an enzyme that dissolves whatever it's sitting on and then it can absorb what it's dissolved and eat it. Um, so that is why this paper was so thin. Um, it can dissolve it to the point where it actually disappears. So there's a lot of missing paper here. And what's left becomes almost like Kleenex. Um, and so it's tissue thin and very crumply. And obviously there's all this crumpled and lost paper along here at the spine where it got the most wet. Mold can attack wood as well. But I think what happened here is that the leather expanded when it was wet and then shrank when it dried and it cracked the wood. The contraction was strong enough to break the wood. And so that's why there's wood missing here and the leather is torn. Um, the dark areas at the tide lines at the edge of the, of the water penetration are um, very common with leather. You get movement of the dye and it also um, causes it sometimes to look burnt. So those are from the water damage. Here you see um, that the sewing thread is also mostly broken. The spine was one of the most water affected areas of the, of the book. Uh, and somebody came along later and added new thread just trying to keep the book together. So some of the thread that's there was added by a later owner um, just to keep the, the book in one piece. And I love these illustrations, uh, measuring distances to different things, showing that geometry was a useful skill. And this book was obviously highly used so my plan for this book was to disbind it entirely, uh, clean and wash the leaves to strengthen the paper, resize them to strengthen them even further. This was a traditional method for paper makers is to dip the leaves in a dilute um, animal hide, animal glue um, solution. And that made them harder and more resistant to water and also stronger when you handle them. Um, so this is often necessary and I knew it would be necessary with these mold eaten leaves mend the leaves and the spine folds of the folios to make the book useful again, re-sew it through the new folds over new sewing supports, reattach the original binding and create a new spine to support that flap of leather that was all that was left of the original book. Here you can see um, one of the page openings from the book and the diagram that I make whenever I have to take a book apart. Um, I need to document its current sewing structure so that I can figure out the best way to put it back together again and make sure that I understand the order of the leaves so that I can put them back properly. This M marks that this is um, the beginning of a signature that the printer produced for this book. Each signature was one single sheet of paper that was printed with multiple pages and then folded to create a section and cut so that there are multiple leaves in one section. This was a book that is an octavo, which means it had eight leaves or 16 pages printed on every piece of paper. And this is the arrow in my diagram that shows exactly where we're looking, the beginning of section M and the end of section L. And um, this is some of the additional sewing thread that was added by a later owner to keep the book together. Before I could wash the book, I wanted to try to remove as much of the superficial dirt and mold as I could. So I used um, polyurethane cosmetic sponges, which are very soft and gentle, but a lot of the paper that had been mold eaten, I could not touch at all. It was too delicate and too weak to be um, cleaned in this way. 
I did open out all of the crumpled edges. So I worked locally with a water brush to open out those little fragments and bits that were crumpled up and folded on themselves. That took a very long time. I wanted to be sure that the leaf could be fully penetrated by the water and that those folds would not become um, sort of locked in place during bathing. This folio, one of the difficulties with washing this book, I couldn't just dunk it in water as I sort of did with the Okipa book that I showed you because the paper was not strong enough. Um, all these mold eaten areas were extremely weak and there were lots of little tattered edges and fragments that might come off in the water if I just put it in the water between sheets of that non-woven polyester like I showed you that still allows the paper to kind of move around a lot in the water and I knew this couldn't tolerate it. But there were aspects of this book that I wanted to um, maintain if I could, evidence of the original structure and, and, and um, how it was produced. So this leaf shows the horizontal and diagonal cockles that are associated with letterpress printing. This paper was actually quite high quality paper, but it was very thin. And when you printed on a letterpress print, um, a letterpress, you usually dampen the sheet beforehand and then the pressure of the type would actually stretch the interior of the sheet, whereas the exterior of the sheet would remain the same size. So the inside kind of becomes bigger than the outside and it has to cockle to take up the extra material. Um, and there were places where this paper was so thin and so stretched that it actually overlapped itself. So I worried about that to some degree. I didn't know whether I could maintain those cockles. Um, another thing that I wanted to maintain, if possible, is these original mends. This paper appears to have ripped potentially during printing, um, and the, the printer himself or potentially the first owner went in and put these strips of Western paper across the tears to keep the page together, and I didn't want to lose those original bits of the book either. I decided in the end to wash this book between leaves of tech wipe, layers of tech wipe, which was essentially first manufactured as a um, cleaning cloth. It's a mixture of cellulose and polyester fibers. It's a microfiber material. And it's very, very highly absorbent. Usually this kind of washing uh, traditionally has been done with cotton blotter, but the tech wipe uh, can be reused, whereas cotton blotter cannot. Once it's stained like this, you just have to throw it out, whereas tech wipe can be washed and reused. Um, one sort of disadvantage to using the tech wipe uh, it, the good reason for using it is that it, it gave a lot of support to the leaves. I didn't have to worry about them washing around in a bath, but I did need to make sure that they were perfectly flat so that they could touch the tech wipe everywhere, which meant I did have to massage out those cockles left over from the letterpress printing process. So those are now lost, but I, um, I sprayed up each leaf with water and ethanol to relax it, and then I massaged it flat, placed it between these damp layers of tech wipe, and you can see how much discoloration and um, moldy material and acidic material is emerging into the tech wipe from the leaves. So you can see that again here. This is some of the used tech wipe. And I could keep washing it and reusing it for the next stack of leaves. Each um, folio went into the tech wipe and washed for six to seven hours. And afterward, it looked much better and was much stronger. I did need to resize it, as I said, with a dilute gelatin solution. So it's like the hide glue that a traditional paper maker would have used, but it's um, you know, essentially photographic gelatin. So a much more purified version. Um, I used a 1.5% solution, which is quite strong for size. And um, I didn't take pictures of that process, but this is another book that's sizing here. So you get an idea. At this point, it was strong enough that it could be immersed without hazard to the paper. So um, that was exciting. And then it was strong enough to be handled and mended. So here I am mending all the losses and mending the spine folds. And I used layers of very thin Asian paper for this because the original paper was itself so very thin. I also had to replace the lost um, wood material in the board here. So this is layers of cardstock and Western paper filling this loss. And um, I re-sewed the book as I did for Okipa over the Raimi ribbon, but I only used two ribbons because I wanted them to fit in between these three original thongs. I didn't want to disturb that original material at all. So I uh, sewed over two supports so that that could be reinserted in between the original material. There I am fraying out the cord slips to be inserted under the back paste down there. And here's the book after treatment. I did make a new spine covering. 
of um, Asian paper laminated to arrow cotton, which um, is a very thin and strong material. So that could be inserted beneath the original leather. And I also consolidated the leather so it wouldn't keep flaking. That's why it's a little darker here than it was on the left. And here's the interior of the book before and after treatment. I added a new blank leaf uh, since it's missing its title page to say it's publication information and to give the reader an idea of what they're looking at. The front leaves, which were detached, were also out of order. So the, the leaves on the right actually give the proper order, whereas um, the, the ones on the left, you'll see they don't correspond exactly because they were out of order. And you can see the, um, the fills here of new paper. So it's intact, but there is some text missing. And the original men's, I was happy to see, stayed in place through the washing, so they're still there. And here's the very back of the book with some delightful um, student work on the paste down before and after treatment with the new form of board attachment there. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that book uh, as well in person. I know I'm out of time, essentially. I tried very hard to talk slower than I usually do, but I talk too slow, I think. If you want to see more about another unusual book I worked on last year, um, you can go to this link, which is in the chat, and um, see this uh, information about this book. I'm using a chair to resew it on because it was so unusual as well. So um, I will just quickly show you, unless Linda, you say not to. Well, thank you, Renee. It's a fabulous talk. Perhaps you can multitask because we have a few questions concerning the uh, plates in the Okipa. Uh, James Hill asks, do we know what the lost plate depicted? I don't personally, I'm sure the information is out there and it may be even available in a digital format, um, but the book is quite rare. So I would, that's something I would have to look into. Um, I'm sure it's been described, but I don't, I don't myself have a picture of it. And Bob Hauser asks is um, if you're able to locate uh, the image, uh, would it be desirable or feasible to create a facsimile of the missing plate from another copy? So or that, how do you relate other material to what you do? Right. That is something that can be done. Um, uh, the goal for conservation treatment is to make clear that this is not an original plate to this book, that it's actually taken from another source. It is a facsimile, so we always mark it as such. Um, but that is something that is done on occasion, is to try to find a good copy and insert it into the book to show what's missing. Um, I did not pursue that with either of these books, um, but if a curator wanted that to be done, then we could try to do that. You know, even, even with interlibrary loan, you might be able to find a copy of the same book and make a facsimile. If there are any other questions, please submit them in the q and I hope you can um, stay a few minutes longer uh, so we can answer some questions that might come up. And Renee can show us the uh, Petrus volume uh, live. Yeah, I will, I will go ahead and do that and just interrupt me if I have a question to answer and I can actually talk about that as well. Um, so I didn't do my prep as well. <laughs> Here is Petrus Ramos's The Scale Board Binding. I also wanted to show you, this is, um, the tech wipe material that I wash these leaves on. So it's just a, a thick but soft um, cellulose and polyester fabric. And it just is great at wicking up stains and moisture. So um, that is that. Here's the front of the book. The scale board here with the vertical um, grain, my new material to replace what was lost and my, my new um, fake title page, a list of the pages that are missing from this book. And here you can see the areas where I've had to insert new material for all that crumpled and mold eaten paper. One of the things I love best about this book is the fabulous woodcuts that are used to illustrate the um, ideas about geometry. So a measuring device. How do you find the radius and diameter of different shapes? 
more measuring devices and calipers. You can see the mold evidence here at the bottom, that staining is often permanent. So I couldn't make that disappear. Um, more sort of measuring devices. This is the leaf that was torn during printing. This sort of jagged loss is often either a, either a um, paper making defect or something that happened during printing. You can see actually another little tear here. So these, I think the paper was so thin, the pressure of the press actually tore these areas of the paper. So I think that's, this is a very early original mend. I wanted to maintain that. Um, you can see the back of it on this side has no mends on it um, and extends throughout the leaf. And here we get to some of the really fun woodcuts. So how do you figure out how far you are from a given point? Or in a ship? Or how tall is that cliff? These are some iron gall ink staining here showing that the book was actually used. How high is my architecture? How deep is my well? <laughs> Some more staining showing that the book was used. This is actually, I believe, handwritten, showing this height of this column. This one particularly amuses me because they put Petrus Ramos's name into this um, triumphal arch that they're measuring. And this is fun because this is showing you how you calculate area and that appears to be the kinds of problems that are worked on the, that was what the student was working with on the back piece down here. This is um, what looks to be marginalia, but it's actually printed, um, how to solve these problems. The printing um, was actually trimmed short when they trimmed the leaves of this book. There's more on this side of the paper. And this actually shows you, you'll see this occasionally, what the binder would leave these little corner flaps that showed exactly how much paper was removed when they trimmed the text block to its final size. So they trimmed off maybe a quarter inch at the foredge. So if they trimmed a little less, they could have left those printed marginalia looking things in place. And they hardly took any at all off the top. So this, this book was almost the full size of the original paper sheet. And that is the end of the book. This uh, stub relates to the missing leaf, which would have been here. And there's my new material going over the back scale board. A little more new material here to replace cracked scale board where the leather shrank and broke it again. So there's the whole book. And you can see the the new spine, the original leather over the new spine supporting it. Thank you, Renee, and thank you to everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm sure Renee is happy to answer any individual questions you might have, so feel free to reach out to her, and thank you again for your support.